All righty, welcome back everyone. So we are going to move on into 4.2 today, which is going to be something uh, very strange. <laughs> you won't get what we're doing at the beginning, but I promise it makes sense. Um, and it's going to be area approximations. We're going to cover a lot of um, odds and ends for this section. But before we get to that, let's knock out the homework. And I know that I assigned, uh, let's see, it was six problems and three of them were starred. But looking at the problems, they only take a second to do. So I'm just going to go ahead and knock all of them out. So here we go. We have the integral or antiderivative of x plus 7 dx. And so to solve that, we use that power rule formula where if I'm taking the integral of x to the n dx, that's equal to, you add 1 to the exponent, so x to the n plus 1, and then you divide by that over n plus 1. So that's the formula we're going to use for this. So I'm going to add 1 to the exponent. There's an understood 1 right here. So it's going to be x squared divided by that new exponent over 2 plus and what do I differentiate to get 7? Well, I differentiate 7x plus c. And that's it. We're done. Not bad, right? So that one wasn't started, neither was this one, but we can knock it out. The integral of x to the fifth plus 1. Okay, we do it exactly the same way. We're going to add 1 to the exponent, so it's going to give us x to the sixth divided by 6 plus x plus c. And that's it. That's the solution. So <laughs> these are pretty quick. They're kind of like, you know, when you first started doing derivatives, uh, using the power rule was pretty fast. <laughs> and then life got complicated, but that's okay. So let's knock out 18. 18 was one of the start ones. So these are the ones that you'll actually self-grade. So we had the integral of 9x to the 8th minus 2x minus 6 dx. Okay, so the way I would do this, at least when you're initially starting this, is to kind of take the coefficient with the variable. So what I mean is this would be, if I add 1 to this exponent, I'm going to get 9x to the 9th. See, I brought that 9 with the x, so that 9x to the 9th divided by 9 minus 2x, I'm going to add 1 to that, squared divided by 2 minus 6x plus c. Alrighty, so this simplifies into x to the 9th minus x squared minus 6x plus c. And that's it. That's your answer right there. So let me clear this and we will do the last three. So next one would be number 20 and that one was starred. So let's see what we have. We have the integral of root x plus 1 over 2 on root x dx. Okay, this looks terrible. But it's not, because at this point, I think you're probably starting to get used to when you see a root and you want to do something to that root, um, you rewrite it in form of a fractional exponent. So let's try that. So this root x becomes x to the 1 half. Yep. Plus, if, you're gonna, if you'll allow me, I'm going to do 1 half x to the, what is this going to be? Well, it's to the one half it's in the bottom so it's going to be to the negative one half dx and now that it's in this form we can use the power rule and knock out the integral so if i use that i'm going to add one so this is going to be one half plus one is three halves divided by three halves so x to the three halves divided by three halves plus one half x to the add one to negative one half I get positive one half divided by positive one half plus c and now I can simplify this this becomes 
if I'm dividing by 3 halves, that's the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. So this is 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. And then the 1 half divided by 1 half cancel. And I'm just left with plus x to the 1 half plus c. Okay? So not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, something similar is in number 23. If you have any questions, just swing by office hours or send me an email, something like that. So for 23, this was not starred. We had the integral of 1 over x to the fifth. Okay, dx. Again, we can't do this integral because, or this antiderivative, if you like, because it's not in a form I can figure out what to do with the exponent. So I'm going to rewrite this as the integral of x to the negative fifth dx. Okay, now that it's in this form, I can add 1 to it. So I'm going to get x to the negative fourth. So I'm adding 1 to negative 5 over negative 4 plus c, which if I wanted to, I could rewrite that. I would not rewrite it like this typically, but if you wanted to, you could say this is negative 1 over 4 x to the 4. But I would plus c. I would almost never do this unless I really needed clarity of what the answer was. Alrighty, so... Last but not least, number 28, or 27, 27, and this one was starred. We had the integral of x plus 1, and then 3x minus 2. So x plus 1 times 3x minus 2 dx. Alrighty, so initially, if you're like me, I would want to figure something to do with a product, since this is a product of two functions, but unfortunately we don't actually learn how to handle that until Calc 2. Um, so you won't see how to handle products with integrals until Calc 2. Uh, so the best way to handle this is to just multiply it all out, gather like terms, and then just take the antiderivative of the resultant polynomial. So this is going to be equal to the integral of, well, x times 3x is going to be 3x squared. x times negative 2 is negative 2x plus 3x times 1 is 3x. So negative 2x plus 3x is plus x. Ne 1 times negative 2 minus 2 dx. Alrighty. Now that I've got it in this form, I can actually do the antiderivative. So I'm going to take the 3 with me. I'm going to add 1 to the 2 to give me x to the third divided by 3 plus x to the second divided by 2 minus, what do I differentiate to get 2? Two, 2x plus c. All right, and all I can do here, it's just a, my gosh, what am I doing? I just took the integral, that sign goes away. Um, so now I've got it into this form. I could simplify it a little bit if I wanted to. Um, this one would become, I'm going to do it this way so I don't run the risk of cutting things off. So uh, it's just going to become x cubed plus x squared over 2 minus 2x plus c. And that is going to be our answer to this one right here. All right, so hopefully that went okay. Um, not too bad at this point, I hope. Uh, if these weren't really familiar, if they didn't feel right, I would suggest practicing with some of the other problems that are in the book, particularly the odd ones, since you have the answers to those, and seeing if you can kind of um, develop a feel for it. It's going to be odd for a while to add one to the exponent and then divide by that. Um, it's just one of those things. But you'll get used to it. No worries. Alrighty, so let me clear this and we will get started with area approximation. So clear and here we go. So let's start with something that's going to, it's going to feel like it's completely out of left field. We're going to start with something called sigma notation. Your life is going to be forever enriched by knowing sigma notation. <laughs> I'm not saying that as a joke either. This is one of the most useful, um, I don't know, techniques 
to represent things that I've ever seen. Uh, you will use it forevermore, uh, not just in math either. You're going to see sigma notation in chemistry, physics, um, anything that you can use math to describe stuff. You're going to bust out sigma notation at some point. So what is sigma notation? Well, sigma notation uses this sigma right here. And that is a really bad sigma. Gosh. Okay. I'm going to try one more time. Give me a do over on this one. Try that a little bit better. So there we go. Much better sigma. So the way that it looks is maybe I've got a sub i in front of it. And I'm going to go i equals 1, 2, 4. Okay. Now, what on earth is all this saying? Sigma notation is often called summation notation because sigma and summation are go hand in hand. They are like peas and carrots. So, sorry, it's very late. <laughs> um, what does it mean? Well, this means that I, which is going to be my index of summation, okay, is going to start, this is my lower bound, equal to one, and then as I move through the notation, it will eventually wind up equaling four, which is the upper bound. Well, what am I talking about? Well, this is equal to a sub one plus a sub two plus a sub three plus a sub four, where a sub one, two, three, and four are just some values. Okay. But the main thing to do is to look at what happened. It starts out, this i gets replaced with the lower bound. So it starts at one, so a sub one. As soon as it fills in that value for all the i's in whatever is over here, you then add the next term and it increments. So it goes from one to two. So now it's a sub two. It's filled in all the i's. So now it adds the next term. It increments to three. And then it adds the next term. And at this point, it hits the upper bound, plugs that in, and it's done. It stops. So a way to kind of look at an example that would make a little more sense would be something like uh, summation i from 1 to 4 of i. Well, that means it's going to start off equal to I'm going to fill it in, substitute in the one. I've done all my substitution. There's only one thing to substitute in for. So now I do the next term and I increment two increment three plus increment and I hit the upper bound and I'm done. So this equals 10. Okay. I can do a summation. Maybe I equals two to five of i squared. Oh boy, I shouldn't have done that. Ugh. Okay, that'll be fine, I can add them up. So what is this gonna be? Well, it's gonna start with the value of two and it's gonna fill that in for this i. So it's gonna become two squared plus increment, three squared plus four squared plus and then it hits the upper bound, five squared. What does that equal? That's four plus nine is 13, plus 16 is 29, plus 25 is 54 maybe, something like that. So that's the way that a sigma notation works. And you can have pretty elaborate um, constructs. Let me show you one that's a little bit more um, <laughs> intricate. We'll just say intricate, we'll leave it like that. So let me clear this. And let's go with something like summation 
pi from 1 to 4 of i plus 2 squared. Okay, we handle it exactly the same way. We start with our lower bound. So this is going to, I'll plug a 1m for the i that's here. So it'd be 1 plus 2 squared plus, and now that I have finished putting my i in for right here, I add to my increment, my um, rather my summation, my uh, the sign is called an addition sign. That's what that thing is. This I do the addition, and then I increment, go to the next value of i. So now i is going to equal two plus two squared plus increment three plus two squared plus four plus two squared. And it has hit the upper bound, so it stops. And this would be 3 squared, 9 plus 16 is 25 plus, whoa, is that real? 9, 16 is 25 plus 25 is 50. Yeah, that's right, 50 plus 36 is 86. That's the final value for that. Alrighty. So it can, this is just, one step you can imagine you can have some crazy summations things like i equals one to i don't know four of i squared minus three cubed over two i minus five and all that you do to evaluate this is you just plug in the lower bound for every i add the next term increment it plug the two in for each i Add the next term, three for the for the next i, etc., until you hit four and you're done. So that's how that works. Nothing crazy. It just there are some really complicated summations that are going to be coming up, but we can handle them. No worries. So first thing I want to do is do a summation i from one to three of two i. Okay. So what is that going to equal? Well, it's going to be 2 times 1 plus 2 times 2 plus 2 times 3. Would you agree? Notice that the 2 is in front of each one of these. This 2 right here is here, here, and here. So I could look at this as 2 times 1 plus 2, plus 3. Factor the 2 out of the whole thing. What is this? Well, this is 2 times the summation i from 1 to 3 of i. So what does that mean? It means that this is the same as this. I can take any constant that is not related or attached to the i. So Additions and subtractions are off because that binds to the i. But if it's just some a factor that's being multiplied by the i, I can take those out of the summation and then just worry with the i's. So as an example, summation i from 1 to 4 of 6i squared. That is the same as 6 times the summation i from 1 to 4 of i squared. Pretty cool, huh? So I already, what was this thing? This is, I've already forgotten. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, it's 6 times, let's see, it's uh, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared. So 1 plus 2 is, uh, 1 plus 4 rather, is 5 plus 9 is 14, plus 16 is 30. So 6 times 30 is 180. And that is exactly what I would get if I had done, instead of moving out and left it in, it would have been 6 times 1 squared, plus 6 times 2 squared, plus 6 times 3 squared, plus 6 times 4 squared. This is way harder than this. So when it comes to summations, if you can take something out, if you can move a constant across the summation, do it. It makes it 
so much easier. Okay? So, I think that's pretty good, but I want to state this. Let me clear this. Actually, I can put it right here. A way to phrase this is, if I'm using very um, solid language, <laughs> if I have a summation of, let's say, k times a sub i, that is the same as k times the summation of a sub i, where k is a constant. Okay, so you can always take a constant across the summation. Now I can clear this and move forward. So clear this. Okay, let me see where next. Oh, let's do this one. What if I had i from 1 to 4 of 1? Okay. This is actually equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. There's no i to plug in, but I still loop through my summation, my sigma, and when I go from the lower bound to the upper bound. This one was the i equals 1 term. This is the i equals 4 term. Even though there wasn't an i to plug in, I still have to loop through and summate. <laughs> summation, <laughs> that's totally the wrong. I'm not an Englisher, so um, a languager. Uh, this <laughs> so it is, you have to still do the summation even if the i isn't present. But look at what happens. This is kind of neat. i equals 1 to 4 of 3. What is that going to equal? 3 plus 3. Plus 3 plus 3 equals 12. Notice anything? Absolutely. This says that if I have the summation i from 1 to some n of some constant, that is just equal to the constant times n. 1 times 4, 4. 3 times 4. 12. That's kind of cool. I like that. Alrighty, so now we are going to take a small detour as I get to regale you with the story of Gauss. You've probably heard this um, in other places, but if you haven't, you're in for a treat. It's one of my favorite little math stories. So there was a Absolutely, he was an absolutely brilliant mathematician named, I think it's Friedrich, Carl Friedrich Gauss or something like that. I don't remember his exact name. I'm looking it up right now, so I can say for sure. Um, he is just absolutely brilliant. Um, from a very young age, he was fascinated with math and numbers and where is he? I'm looking for him. Oh, well, I can't find him. No big deal. Um, so he was a very precocious child, and he was a handful for his teacher. And, yeah, Carl Friedrich Gauss, 1777 to 1855. And the story goes, the legend, whatever, that he was in his classroom, um, kind of being a know-it-all, and... His teacher, in order to give him some busy work, said, go over into the corner and don't come out until you've added up all the numbers from 1 to 100. Okay? Thinking, you know, she'd have at least 30 minutes of peace and quiet while he did all that. And so she turns away to talk to the other students, and he says, I have the answer. And she turns back and was like, uh, yeah, you've got the answer. What's the answer? And he says, the answer is 5,050. And so she, I don't know if it's at that point or later in the day, actually goes through and adds up all the numbers from 1 to 100. 
and it turns out it is equal to 5050. Now, even though he was an absolute prodigy when it comes to mathematics, he didn't add all the numbers up in his head. He wasn't a human calculator like that. What he was, what he excelled at was seeing patterns and thinking about things in a way that is sort of unusual. So let's see what Gauss did, how he did what he did by adding the numbers from 1 to 10. That's way easier than 1 to 100. Okay, so I'm going to enumerate them. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. Alrighty, and now if we add all those together, let's see, it's 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15, plus 6 is 21, plus 7 is 28, plus 8 is 36, plus 9 is 45, plus 10 is 55. Okay, but he didn't do it that way. What he realized intuitively is that there is a pattern. We're adding one each time to these numbers. So the pattern is, if I look at it, there are these little connection bars. If I add the least to the most, I get a value. And then if I go up by one and down by one, it's the same value. Up by one, down by one, same value. So one plus 10 is 11. Two plus nine is 11. Three plus eight is 11. Four plus seven is 11. And five plus six is 11. So how many 11s do we have? Well, we have five, but an even easier way is we have, these are all pairs. How many pairs do we have if we add up numbers from one to 10? Well, there are 10 numbers. So how many pairs are in 10 numbers? Exactly. 10 divided by two, 10 divided by two, five pairs. So five times 11, equals 55. Okay. So what did he do? He realized that the pairs for adding numbers from one to a hundred were equal to 101. And then how many pairs were there? They're 50. 101 times 50, 5,050. So that's how he was able to add up the numbers from 1 to 100 in seconds. If you have not seen this before, or if you at least haven't amazed your friends and family, this is a wonderful trick. It is just so nice to be able to knock out and say, "I give me a number, an, an even number from 1 to 100, and then, you know, go from there. Add it up from one to that value real fast. Um, okay, actually, it probably they won't be all that impressed, and you'll look like a show off. But if if you can find the right person, uh, it's it's a cool trick to show them at the very least. Um, you could say I'm going to add the numbers from one to a thousand together. Well, what is that going to be? Well, that's going to be one thousand and one times how many pairs? Five hundred. So it's going to be. 500,500, right? So <laughs> that's, that's a lot faster than adding up the numbers between one and a thousand. Now, why am I showing you all this? Well, other than this being one of my favorite little math stories, there is meaning to this because now we can kind of use this with sigma notation. So what do I, how do I, denote adding the numbers from 1 to 100 with sigma notation. Well, that's i equals 1 to 100 of i. That's going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 plus 99 plus 100, right? 
and we saw that you could get that by adding the least to the greatest and then multiplying that by the number of pairs. So if I call this value right here in, this value right here in, I can say, well, I'm going to, the, the value of the pairs is n plus 1, right? Plus the n plus the least, which is 1, times, well, how many pairs are there? Well, I divide n by 2. But a more common way to see this formula is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And that will actually give you the correct answer. So there you go. This is, let me actually write this very formally, summation i from 1 to n of i equals n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay? Now, that one is really easy to see. This next one is not. <laughs> I have done it once. I spent a class and a half deriving this thing, well, and the one that follows. Um, I thought it was cool, uh, but my, the students did not enjoy it as much as I did, and uh, I would not torture you with that ever again. So, um, turns out, that if I do the summation i from 1 to n of i squared, that is equal to n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Okay? <laughs> I know you're like, how in the world do you get that? You get it by actually just adding up, looking at patterns. Eventually you can kind of figure out how this all shakes out. Um, but it's not obvious and it's not fun. I did not enjoy it that much. Well, actually, I, I did enjoy it, but um, anywho. So uh, let's actually do an example of that. So let's say I'm adding up the numbers from one to four of I squared. Well, that's going to be N is now four. So it's going to equal 4 times 4 plus 1, 5, times 2 times 4 plus 1. So 2 times 4 is 8, plus 1 is 9, divided by 6. So this is going to equal, I've got, this will be a 3 and a 2. That'll go to a 3. 2 times 5 times 3, 30. And if you think back, I've already done that, and the answer was 30, because it was 1 plus 4 plus 9 plus 16, and that did equal 30. Okay? So this is your second formula that you have to kind of commit to memory. Really, these two are enough to get by. Okay? When I say commit to memory, you don't actually have to commit to memory. Um, I would personally commit this one to memory, just because this is a good one to have. This one I'd probably look up each time, but it is important. Okay. Now the last formula is going to be, as you can probably already imagine, summation i from 1 to n of i cubed. That one is n squared times quantity m plus 1 squared over 4. And that's the last one that we're going to go over. This one I never remember, ever, ever. <laughs> I always have to look this one up. But these two I try to keep with me. This one is always with me. I'll never, ever forget that just because I remember the whole Gauss story. This one I can usually dredge up if I think about it for a few seconds. This one, forget it. It's just, I look it up every single time. All right, now, why am I showing you these? Well, the reason that we're going through this is so I can do things like, I think I've got enough room right here. It should be okay. What if I had um, maybe summation i from 1 to 10 of 
i squared plus i plus 3. What is that? Well, it turns out, just like with almost every other construct that we've looked at, I can write this as three individual summations. 1 to 10 for i squared, plus summation 1 to 10 of i, plus the summation 1 to 10 of 3. Well, summation from 1 to 10 of i squared is going to evaluate into this formula here. So it's going to be 10 times 11 times 21 over 6 plus this one is the formula for i, so it's this formula, 10 times 11 over 2 plus this is where we're adding a constant this many times, so it's just this constant times this many times, so plus 30. Whatever this value is, that's what this evaluates to. Uh, if we did it out, that would be a 5 and a 3, that would be a 7, 55 times 7, ugh, nope, not doing it, okay. And this would be a 5 right there. Ugh, that's a lot. 55, uh, I don't want to do that. 55 times 7, 7. 35, 385, would this be 385 plus 55 plus 30, something like that? What would that give me? That's 85 plus 385 is 470, yeah, maybe something like that. Alrighty, not important. The important thing is by using these summations, I can now evaluate things that start off looking pretty bad. And I can do it individually by breaking them in individual terms and just using the formulas and the property that I have to actually evaluate each one separately and then just add them all together. Alrighty? Whew. So now that we've got that, let's do one more example and then we'll move to the next piece. So let me stop this let's see do that okay so let's see let what if i had summation uh, i from one to n of i plus one over n squared okay well this looks terrible because now I've got I's and N's, but it's not so bad. This is our index of summation. This is our the one that we can't move across. Anything that is a constant can be moved across the summation. And N is a constant. It's not going to vary. It will be set, whatever it is. So we can move N's across the summation. We can't move I's, but we can move N's. What I mean? Well, I can rewrite this as 1 over n squared times the summation i from 1 to n of i plus 1. Okay? So now I can do another rewrite and say that's 1 over n squared of bracket summation i from 1 to n of i plus summation i from 1 to n of 1, right? Okay, and I happen to know what this evaluates to, because that evaluates to 1 over n squared times, well, this is the summation of i, so it's going to be n times n plus 1 over 2, and the summation of 1 n times, it's just going to be 1 times n, n. Okay? Well, I can now do a common denominator here. If I do that, I get 1 over n squared. This is going to be n squared plus n over 2 plus, if I put that over 2, I have to do a 2 on top, 2n over 
two by the end. That would be weird. So, two. Would you agree that I can do that? I can to get a common denominator, change n to 2n over 2. Absolutely. So now if I do that, I'm going to get 1 over n squared times, well, I'm going to have n squared plus n plus 2n is 3n over 2. Okay. So now that I've got that expression, I'm going to just multiply the n squared through the 1 over n squared. If I do that, I get n squared plus 3n over 2n squared. Alrighty, now I can do one thing. Since every single term has an n in common, I can divide that out and wind up with n plus 3 over 2n. Alrighty. Now, why did I do all that work? Well, I'm going to make a table. <laughs> and my table just went off the rails. Let me try that again. I can draw a straight line or an approximation, I think. Alrighty, so I'm going to have n And a value. Okay. So we're going to start off. Let's let n equal 10. That would be 10 plus 3, 13, divided by 20. That's going to be 0 0.65. Okay. Now I'm going to let n equal 100. 100 plus 3 is 103, divided by 200 is 0. 515. Probably see where this is going. A thousand. Now it's going to be a thousand and three divided by two thousand. Zero point five zero one five. Ten thousand. Zero point five zero zero one five. Alrighty, I think you probably see the pattern. What is, you ready? The limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 3 over 2n. Well, the easiest way to do that is just to break this into two terms. Limit as n goes to infinity of n over 2n plus 3 over n. This term goes to what? 0. This term, the n's cancel, goes to what? 1 half. 1 half plus 0, 1 half. So as n goes to infinity, this expression goes to 1 half. Now, I hope that was, at this point, it should all look like, okay, cool, but hopefully it made sense what we did. What we did is we started off with an expression of i's and n's. We used the formulas, this formula and this uh, property right here, to get the i's in terms of n's. We then just did simple algebra. We found common denominators, collected like terms, simplified, and we wound up with this expression right here. Then we started running different values for n, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and we could see that it was heading towards 0 0.5. But we locked it down when we actually took the limit. And the limit, when we took the limit, it was exactly the same type of thing that we would do when we were doing the um, horizontal asymptotes from the last chapter. And it wound up being 1 half, which is the 0 0.5 that we thought it was approaching. Okay? So we are going to pick up with all of this in the next lecture. But for now, 
I'm going to give you a little bit of homework so you can practice the sigma notation and converting from expressions with I into straight expressions that were just, just plain old N. Okay, so let me clear this and put the homework up. Clear. Clear. <laughs> so homework is going to be, this is from section 4.2 knock out 5, 7, 17, 20, uh, 21, and 25. And star 5, 21, and 25. Okay. 21, you have to be clever to solve it. I'll go ahead and warn you in advance. You have to do some something to it so that it will be solvable. And 25 is like the last example that we just did. So just kind of find your expression in N, and then you can run through. You don't have to do all the different values that I wanted to do. Once you get your expression completely simplified in terms of N for 25, just do the limit as N goes to infinity. You don't have to do the 10, 100, 1,000, and all that. So. Alrighty. Have fun with it. I think you will. I know I always enjoy Sigma stuff and I will see you later. Stay safe. Take care and bye bye.